We want to take you now live to Madison Square Garden in New York City, where former President Donald Trump is holding a rally. There have been roughly two dozen speakers so far today, including Rudy Giuliani, Tucker Carlson, Hulk Hogan, you, Elon Musk, former First Lady Melania Trump just introduced her husband. And let's listen into the former president. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much to a very popular former first lady, hopefully first lady again. And I just want to say a very big hello to a special place, New York, and to an incredible arena, Madison Square Garden. Incredible. And then we have all of the people that could fill it up 10 times. You take a look at outside what's going on all the way down to the river, the beautiful, beautiful Hudson River. They're outside watching this now at levels that nobody's ever seen before. They've never had it. And I want to thank Jim Dolan. He's been incredible. He's been just incredible. The job they've done. Job they've done. Thank you. But I'm thrilled to be back in the city I love and thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots. You're with me. We're all together. We've always been together. And I'd like to begin by asking a very simple question. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? I'm here today with a message of hope for all Americans. With your vote in this election, I will end inflation. I will stop the invasion of criminals coming into our country. And I will bring back the American dream. We need the American dream to come back home. Our country will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer, and stronger than ever before. This election is a choice between whether we will have four more years of gross incompetence and failure, or whether we will begin the four greatest years in the history of our country. We will achieve success that no one can imagine we will have the strongest economy, the most secure borders, the safest cities, the most powerful military, the best trade deals, and we will dominate the frontiers of science, medicine, business, technology, and space. And I'm asking you to be excited about the future of our country again. I'm asking you to dream big again. We're going to dream big again. We haven't been dreaming big at all. This will be America's new golden age. It's going to happen quickly, too, very quickly. Every problem facing us can be solved, but now the fate of our nation is in your hands. Next Tuesday, you have to stand up and you have to tell Kamala Harris, that you've done a terrible job. That crooked Joe Biden has done a terrible job. You've destroyed our country. We're not going to take it anymore. Kamala, you're fired. Get out. Get out. You're fired. Early voting is underway in every swing state, and we are setting all-time records. They're voting, I tell you what. I don't want to talk about it. But we have to keep it going. we got to get out and vote. We just have to get out. And uh, who would have thought this was going to happen? We're leading in every swing state. But it doesn't mean a thing. It only means how are we doing at the end. So 
Look, we have nine days from now, and we're going to defeat Kamala Harris, and we're going to win back the beautiful White House, and we're going to make America great again, and it's going to happen fast. Thank you. In less than four years, Kamala Harris has shattered our middle class. She cast the deciding votes that launched the worst inflation in the history of our country. She cost the typical American family over $3,000 in a short period, but over $30,000 over the last three years. She killed 50,000 manufacturing jobs this year alone. Now Kamala wants to raise the typical family taxes by nearly $3,000 a year and impose a 33% tax hike on all domestic production. If Kamala Harris gets four more years, our economy can never recover. If I win, we will quickly build the greatest economy in the history of the world. Which is what we had in our last term. We will rapidly defeat inflation and we will very simply make America affordable again. We're going to make it affordable. I will massively cut taxes for workers and small businesses, and we will have no tax on tips, no tax on overtime, and no tax on Social Security benefits for our seniors. And I'm announcing a new policy today that I will support a tax credit for family caregivers who take care of a parent or a loved one. It's about time that they were recognized, right? They add so much to our country and are never spoken of ever, 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 but they're going to be spoken of now. Thank you all very much. I'll also make Interest on car loans, fully tax deductible, but only for cars made in America. Have to be made in America. And we will achieve energy independence, and we will do something we wanted so badly. We're going to do something. You know what we're going to do? Front row Joe's. You know, I got front row Joes here. I got the ladies from North Carolina, number 249. This is the 200, and they, you look so beautiful. We have a lot of people. They followed us, but we're going to do something. The ladies can tell you what we're going to do. We're going to drill a baby drill. And I will terminate the Green News scam and we'll cut your energy prices in half, 50%, within one year from January 20th. Is the fake news hearing that? Whoa! Look how much. Wow, that's a lot of fake news. That is a lot of fake news. Look at that. Wow. That's got to be a record, Mr. Speaker. I think that's a record. That is a lot of fakers back there. <laughs> to bring back millions of jobs, we will give our companies the lowest taxes, the lowest energy costs, the lowest regulatory burdens, and free access to the best and biggest market on the planet. Remember this. If we keep going like this, we won't have the biggest and the best. We won't have a market. We won't have a country. But only for those who make their product here in the USA and hire American workers for the job. 
And if these companies don't make their products here, then they will pay a very stiff tariff when they send their products into the United States for the privilege of competing with our workers and our now protected companies. We're going to protect our companies. They're not leaving anymore. They're not leaving anymore. We're also going to pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act, meaning if China or any other country charges us 100 or 200 percent tax or tariff, we will then charge them a 100 or 200 percent tax or tariff. It's called an eye for an eye. And I will never apologize for defending America. I will protect our workers. I will protect our jobs. I will protect our borders. I will protect our great families. And I will protect the birthright of our children to live in the richest and most powerful nation on the face of the earth. As we rescue our economy, I will also restore our borders. There's never been anything like it. It's bigger than inflation. It's bigger than the economy. What they're doing to our country, they're allowing criminals from all over the world to enter our country. Over the past four years, Kamala Harris has orchestrated the most egregious betrayal that any leader in American history has ever inflicted upon our people. She has violated her oath, eradicated our sovereign border, and unleashed an army of migrant gangs who are waging a campaign of violence and terror against our citizens. There has never been anything like it anywhere in the world for any country. Kamala has imported criminal migrants from prisons and jails, insane asylums and mental institutions from all around the world, from Venezuela, to the Congo, a lot of people are coming from the Congo prisons. They're coming from all over the world. Over the last month, 181 countries violated our laws. And she has resettled them into your communities to prey upon innocent American citizens. But the day I take the oath of office, the migrant invasion of our country ends and the restoration of our country begins. One of the deadliest and most vicious migrant gangs that Kamala has imported into our country is the savage Venezuelan prison gang. Nice group of people. They got together in prison, the worst prison in the world, they say. It's called Tren de Aragua. And that is taking over apartment complexes and unleashing a violent killing spree all over America, especially in Aurora, Colorado, where we have a governor who's petrified of them, and maybe he should be. But now they've even taken over Times Square. Take a look. Order's deadly consequences. Border crisis, record high crossings are putting a strain on cities across America. It is a full-blown invasion. Armed Venezuelan gang members storming an apartment complex in Aurora, Colorado. When people talk about my good crime, this is what they're talking about. San Antonio, Texas, just one of the latest cities to have apartment complexes taken over by members of the Venezuelan gang. Biden and Harris had created a program to bring them in under humanitarian parole. I am in favor of saying that we're not going to treat people who are undocumented across the border as criminals. More than 13,000 illegal immigrants convicted of murder have been released into the United States. My 20-year-old daughter, Kayla Hamilton, was murdered in her own room. Kayla's murderer was apprehended by Border Patrol crossing illegally into the U.S. Kayla's murderer had been improperly released into the United States. Abolish ICE. Yeah, we need to probably think about starting from scratch. More than a dozen people suspected of being Tren de Aragua gang members right here in San Antonio. The gang members had been terrorizing the apartment complex. New details in the murder of Lake and Riley. The illegal immigrant suspect who cops say committed the heinous murder is a Venezuelan national. And was paroled and released into the country 
by the Biden administration. If they'd all been properly vetted, that probably wouldn't have happened. Two men investigators say are in the country illegally from Venezuela are charged with capital murder and the death of Jocelyn Nungaray. Martinez and Angel wrapped his arms around it. Jocelyn's neck, took off her pants, and climbed on top of her, later strangled Jocelyn to death and then tied up her hands and feet. Court documents suggest a group of men arrested for beating and robbing a Dallas woman last month are members of a Venezuelan street gang. The men threatened to cut off her fingers if she did not cooperate. Manuel Hernandez Hernandez was booked by Colleyville police just two days earlier and released the day before the robbery. A Peruvian gang leader who was wanted for 23 murders. He was arrested by Border Patrol near Roma, Texas, then released into America. That's who we're allowing into our country. We're not, we're not going to have a country any longer. That's who we're allowing in. The United States is now an occupied country, but it will soon be an occupied country no longer. Not going to be happening. Not going to be happening. November 5th, 2024, nine days from now, will be Liberation Day in America. It's going to be Liberation Day. On day one, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history to get the criminals out. I will rescue every city and town that has been invaded and conquered, and we will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail. We're going to kick them the hell out of our country as fast as possible. And to expedite removals of Trende Aragua and other savage gangs like MS-13, which is equally vicious, I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. Think of that. That's how far back. That's when they had law and order. They had some tough ones. Think of it, the Alien Enemies Act of 1798. You hear that, Mr. Speaker? Get ready. <laughs> to target and dismantle every migrant criminal network operating on American soil. And there are lots of them. We don't have the same country anymore. You know that. And you know, when you look at the polls and they say about the economy and they have all these different things, the worst nightmare that we're facing is what they've done to us on our borders. We had the safest border in the world. In fact, there's a chart, which I hope they have, because I didn't tell them I wanted it. But there's a chart that I love very much because I wouldn't be here without it. That's it. I love it. I'm in love with it. I love that chart. Even if it had bad numbers, I would have loved that chart, but it doesn't. It has great numbers. And if you look at the arrow on the bottom, you'll see that was the day I left office. That was the lowest illegal immigration that we've ever had in recorded history, the recorded history of our country. And then look at it. It was like an Elon Musk rocket ship. Look at what happens. Look at what happened after that. And if they come back into our country, it's an automatic 10 years in jail with no possibility of parole. And I'm here by calling for the death penalty for any migrant that kills an American citizen or a law enforcement officer. Under Kamala, America is a sanctuary for criminals and for illegal aliens that are in our country illegally. I will immediately ban all sanctuary cities in the United States.
Kamala's gross incompetence disqualifies her from being president of the United States of America. She is grossly incompetent. All you have to do is look at her interviews. Look at what she did the other night on fake news, CNN. Just take a look. She couldn't answer a question. She's unfit for office. Everyone knows it. No one respects her. No one trusts her. No one takes her seriously. Everyone knows she is a very low IQ individual. From humiliating our country in Afghanistan to the war in Ukraine, to the nightmare on our border, to her inflation catastrophe, all done in conjunction with Sleepy Joe. But he was largely sleeping, wasn't he? After four o'clock, it's time to go to bed. To his and her egregious hurricane response, the worst response in North Carolina and other states since Katrina, but I think it was even worse than Katrina. They haven't even responded in North Carolina. They haven't even responded. There's nobody. They don't see any FEMA. You know why? They spent their money on bringing in illegal migrants. So they didn't have money for Georgia and North Carolina and Alabama and Tennessee and Florida and South Carolina. They didn't have any money for them. They spent all of their money on bringing in illegal immigrants and flying them in by beautiful jet planes they flew in. We just found that about a year and a half ago. Remember, we said, what's going on? Those planes, a lot of planes going over there. What are they? They would fly them into the middle of our country, our beautiful, beautiful country. And you know what happened? You take a look at Springfield, Ohio. Think of this. Where, think of this. Where 30 thousand illegal migrants were put into a town of 50,000 people. No, no place can withstand that. Or take a look at Aurora in Colorado. Colorado is going to vote for us. You know why? Typically, they go a little bit the other way. Of course, with their voting system, I'm not so sure about that. But you know why? Because they tried to throw the leading candidate of both parties, meaning me, I was leading both parties off the ballot, and the people of Colorado, including Democrats, are very angry about it. They are a threat to democracy, to use their term. Isn't it nice to have somebody that's your president that doesn't need a teleprompter? We haven't been on teleprompter for a long time. I haven't been on this teleprompter. No, it is nice. You saw the other day where Kamala got a little stuck on the teleprompter, went a little bad, it stopped on her. You have to be, you know, if you're a politician, you have to be able to handle that. Remember? You have to do the weave, he says. Got to do the weave. You got to do more than the week. <laughs> but it happens a lot as a politician. It happens. I mean, we have so many politicians here, great ones. Really great, because some are not so good, but great ones. <laughs> and when Newt, or when the Speaker, or when uh, Tommy Tuberville, who's here someplace, the great senator from Alabama, or when any one of our literally 75, by the way, should I introduce all of them by name? I should. Should I? No? Yes? I don't know. It's a lot. Speaker, should I? I don't know. Will they be angry? Yeah, they will. It's a lot of introducing, right? Let's keep going with this speech, huh? But you know, when you have a, uh, when you're in this profession, I have a friend who wanted to come in. I said, uh, what's your, do you like speaking? Well, I do, but I have a great fear of speaking. I said, don't be a politician. If you have a fear of speaking, don't be a politician. But one thing you have to know is that no matter how good your people are that operate this machinery, it's going to break. And you're going to be out there all by yourself a lot. And you got to be able to do so. Three weeks ago, she was saying there was only 32 days left, right? And she's reading it like, huh? Oh, it's 32 days, and it stopped. And she went, this 32 days. 32, 
32. And I was watching. I said, this isn't pretty. 32. She was gone. And then, damn it, it kicked back on. She was gone. Uh, we've had it. it. Happens a lot. And don't forget, you got all those people back there. Now, they don't talk about her. But if that ever happened, it happens all the time. I was campaigning in Ohio for a very, very Bernie Marino. He's doing a good job. I think he's maybe going to win in Ohio. It's, it's the problem, he's got his opponent, Brown, Sherrod Brown. He's taking ads in like he's my best friend. He never votes for me. He's not my best friend. Ohio's been very friendly to Trump. We win it all the time by a landslide. But the opponent is taking ads. I got four of them. I think we have four of them, right? Four, they're taking ads. All of a sudden, they love Trump. We agree with Trump on tariffs. We agree with Trump on the border. We love Trump. And they're Democrats. Their friends calling up. Did they switch to the Republican Party? But it happened with Bernie Marino. I was in Ohio to, to try and get him over the initial primary hump. And it was 45 mile an hour winds, and these suckers were blowing like, you ever try reading a teleprompter where it's moving about two feet in each? <laughs> but I didn't have to worry about that because even worse, they ended up blowing off the stage a lot of it. So I'm now in the first sentence, and I got 28,000 people and millions of people watching on television. I got no teleprompter. And did I do a good job, Mr. Speaker? And he won. And he won, huh? Thank you, Matt. And he won. And uh, so you're up there all alone. We don't go 32, 32, 32. Oh, my God. Whatever. Kamala Harris is a train wreck who has destroyed everything in her path to make her president would be a gamble with the lives of millions and millions of people. She would get us into World War III. We're very close to World War III. If you don't have a smart president, if you don't have a president that gets it, if you don't have a president that is respected by the other side, and they did respect us four years ago, they really respected us. Iran was broke. They had no money. Russia wouldn't have played with us at all. Russia would have never gone into Ukraine. Israel, October 7th, would never, ever have happened. Would have never have happened. All those... All those people would be alive right now, all those people that were killed on that horrible day. But if you don't have a president that gets it, you know, you know what else you wouldn't have had? You wouldn't have had that the most embarrassing day in the history of our country, in my opinion, Afghanistan, the way they, not that they got out, we were getting out, but we were going to get out with dignity and strength. We got out an embarrassment, the likes of which this country has never suffered. And because of that, Putin, looked at us and they probably figured we were a paper tiger and he went into Ukraine and the rest is history. It would have never happened with us. And you wouldn't have had any inflation. You know, we had the best economy, but we had no inflation. And inflation has destroyed a lot of seniors on fixed income and a lot of people in this room have been virtually destroyed by inflation. You wouldn't have had inflation. They screwed up our energy and it went up so much. And then they started spending far too much money on things like the Green News scam, which is just a scam, just a complete scam. They actually admitted that, if you think about it. But she would get us into World War III because she's incompetent, can't do the job, unfit for it. And then all of your sons and daughters will end up getting a little notice They'll say, Mom, Dad, what is this little green piece of paper? Ay, 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 darling, that's a draft notice. They're drafting you to go and fight in some country that I've never heard this country. I've never heard of this country before. Oh, no, I don't want my baby to fight. I don't want my baby to be killed. What they did in Afghanistan with those 13 great soldiers, I've gotten to know the parents so well, and leaving all of that equipment behind, and leaving Americans behind, and many, many people with no legs and no arms, all because of incompetent people. But we don't want your sons and daughters to get a little draft notice and you have to explain to them what it means. 
We're tired of fighting. I'm the only president in the last 84 years that didn't start a war. Remember Crooked Hillary? Remember Crooked Hillary Clinton? Crooked Hillary, oh, she was a beauty during one of our many debates. <laughs> she said, look at him, listen to him. He's going to start a war. Listen to his rhetoric. He's going to start a war. I said, no, no, no. My rhetoric is going to keep us out of wars. And that's what happened. 82 years. Other than I finished off ISIS, but that was already started. We had stupid generals like Milley and Mattis, weak, stupid people. But fear not, we have great generals, just not the ones that you see on television all the time. And we wiped them out very quickly. It was going to take five years. Mattis said it would take five years, and I'm not sure we could do it. It took us like four weeks. We have great generals. We have the greatest military in the world. Just a lot of people don't know that. And everybody knows it, but, you know, I saw the other day a report that they issued that if we end up in a war with China, we cannot win. We're not strong enough. So I said to myself, assuming that's true, how stupid are you to put out a report like that? How stupid? Why would you put out a report? Then they'll say, oh, Trump is not truthful. No, I'm smart. You don't put out reports like that. And it's not true. We would kick their ass. It's not true. <laughs> Our enemies are laughing at her. They want her to win so badly. Oh, they don't want Trump. They don't want Trump. I've made this position a very dangerous one because of that. That's why. It's a very dangerous. You know, if you drive a race car, you have one tenth of one percent chance of dying. If you ride the bulls, I think the bulls are pretty nasty, right? You have about the same one tenth of one percent of dying. If you become president of the United States, you got a hell of a shot at dying. I never knew that when I ran. I never thought about it, but but here we are. Here we are. And I'm okay with it. And I would rather be here than any place in the world. It's called a very dangerous profession. But if we win, our enemies won't be laughing anymore. They're not going to be laughing. And you know what? The truth is, I got along with all of them. I got along with Putin. Ukraine was the apple of his eye. But I said, Vladimir, don't go in. Remember, I ended the pipeline in Europe. I ended the pipeline in Europe. And then when Biden came in, he approved it. But he ended the Keystone pipeline, the one in America. So he got it, he got it a little mixed up, didn't he, huh? Nord Stream 2, I said, we're ending Nord Stream 2. Everybody said, what is Nord Stream 2? I said, that's the massive Russian pipeline where they're going to make a fortune, where they're going to Germany and all countries. All right, you have been watching uh, former said, President Donald Trump at NATO this rally at Madison Square Garden in New York City, sort of a, a homecoming uh, for Trump who grew up in the area. Uh, you know, according to Madison Square Garden's website, the venue tonight seats about 9,500 people. Um, and it, every seat, from what we can tell, is packed at that place. There were roughly two dozen speakers today, everyone from Rudy Giuliani to Hulk Hogan, Tucker Carlson, Elon Musk, a surprise appearance from the former first lady, Melania Trump, who has not spent a lot of time on the campaign trail stumping for her husband. She came out tonight and she introduced her husband. There was a quick kiss on stage and then uh, he began to speak. Now, he's been speaking for probably 30 minutes or so, and he can go, you know, an hour, hour and a half at rallies like this. The, the speech, his speech tonight started out uh, sort of hopeful. Now, the first thing he asked is an important question in politics. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? He talked about ending inflation, that there's going to be a new golden age, he talked about the economy. And he said, I'm going to ask you to be excited about our future. 
And then he got into some of these things that, you know, we in the media need to fact check. Things, you know, that, that some things that we have to fact check, some things that we can't tell if he's right about when he says October 7th wouldn't have happened if he was president, Russia wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if he was president. Those are unknowables. But things like the Biden-Harris administration diverting money from FEMA after a hurricane to pay for illegal immigrants to fly into this country, there are things like that that we can fact check that, we, that, is, that, that, that is not true. Um, he cast out on the voting system in this country, obviously the election. Uh, he took shots at the media, said Kamala Harris will get us into World War III, that your children are going to be drafted. If she is president, he called generals stupid. Uh, he talked about a potential war with China and what would happen in that. I can't really even repeat what he said. Um, so those are the things that we've been listening to over the last 20 or so minutes. I want to bring Alison Kosick in here, who has been uh, listening to the speech with me. And, you know, Alison, a lot of this is what we have heard on the, the campaign trail from the former president so far. I, I don't know if I've heard that our country is occupied before. He said that tonight, that our country is occupied and that on day one, he will liberate the country. There is this language that seems to have ramped up with just nine days to go. Yeah, that disparaging language we certainly heard with the speakers before the, the former president took the stage. Um, that comedian, Tony Hinchcliffe, yeah. disparaging racist comments um, for one, uh, you know, playing off of uh, what the former president had said about Puerto Rico, saying that there, you know, there's an island uh, sitting out there and it's a, it's a pile of garbage. Mm. And, uh, you know, even uh, from what we could see from our reporting uh, there at Madison Square Garden, there was some visible discomfort from those in the audience. That wasn't received of, well at all. Not received well from uh, Tony Hinchcliffe's uh, comments. Uh, a couple things that struck me about the former president's um, speech at the beginning, and you, we talked about that, he went through a lot long laundry list of things that he said he would do once he became president. Uh, he said he would build the greatest economy in the history of the world and then proceeded to kind of rattle off literally a laundry list of the things he said he would do. And they include defeat inflation, cut taxes for workers, no taxes on tips, no taxes on Social Security, cut energy prices in half within the first year, uh, give companies the lowest regulatory uh, burden and give them the lowest taxes and on and on. And then, of course, no explanation how he would pay for this. And, you know, he's guilty of this, too, as is Kamala Harris uh, with the burden. You know, with the growing national debt, how are you going to pay for these programs? He also um, announced what he said was a new program, yeah, and that is giving a tax credit uh, to those who have to care for their family members. And he's really, really hitting on a subject that hits the hearts of many here in this country. Um, one in five, more than one in five Americans over the age of 50 are caring for a loved one. So this is something that many Americans can relate to, and it's a burden that really no one has, has figured a, a good solution to because it's so expensive. Um, but it's really hard to see what the political will would be for uh, for any kind of legislative action for this and what kind of support there would be for this, simply because it's so expensive. Uh, President Obama had uh, proposed something similar to this, and it was, it was just too expensive. What I found interesting about that is that Kamala Harris has been talking about that, and it's been pretty right. effective for her. And, and, and I think they, they both have kind of done that. They, the campaigns see what, what works for the other, and then it kind of seeps in. Let's bring in Rachel Scott, who you know, has been at virtually every uh, Trump rally this year, and she's there uh, tonight at Madison Square Garden. Rachel, uh, we know the place is electric. I watched almost all of this tonight with the two dozen or so speakers. What's it like to be there? And talk about the rhetoric you've heard, because, um, you know, it was, it was dark, and at times it was just racial. Yeah, yeah, and I appreciate you taking me over the phone, Phil. There's so many people here. This rally is so packed. We can't even get out a signal. I just left the arena really quickly to step out by a concession stand in order to provide some reporting here. This rally was dark and incendiary and vulgar from the moment that it started. Before Donald Trump even stepped on the stage, you had several speakers making profane, racist, sexist comments. You had one speaker calling Vice President Kamala Harris the devil and the antichrist. You had that comedian, which you were just talking about with Allison, referring to Puerto Rico, U.S. territory, as a floating island of garbage. That is prompting some pretty swift condemnation from Republicans, including Republicans in Florida, which is home to over a million Puerto Ricans. Uh, Senator, Tim Scott, Senator Rick Scott writing, it's not funny and it's not true. You had 
um, Maria Vira Salazar, who also represents Florida, calling those comments disgusting. I will tell you, I reached out to the Trump campaign. I've asked if they are condemning these comments uh, from this comedian who took the stage before the former president. I still have not heard back. It does raise a question, though, if the Trump campaign, why put someone on stage like this when they're trying to appeal to this very demographic, when they're trying to pitch Latino and Hispanic voters, where the former president has tried to make inroads um, with these demographics and these key demographic groups ahead of this critical election. Uh, the rhetoric coming from the former president today turning increasingly dark, and he's making some campaign promises that we've heard him make very often, promising the largest deportation in American history, going after Vice President Kamala Harris repeatedly. Remember, he said that he doesn't believe personal attacks should be off the table. He said he's entitled to them. Phil? Yeah, and, and Rachel, I want to I want to follow up on one thing that you you, you talked about, just to, to put a, a fine point on what the the, the comedian uh, Tony Hinchcliffe had said. Um, it was that that horrible floating island of garbage, but there were much more vulgar comments about the Latino population that he made outside of that that I, I won't even re repeat. Um, so it was really offensive. And I'm wondering, and you and I have talked about this over the last couple of days while we were watching uh, the vice president's rally in Houston with Beyonce, mm -hmm. you know, is this a rally? And, and I asked this question tonight because of what that comedian said when, when both can candidates are going for that young Latino, young uh, black vote. Is this a rally to convert people over to his MAGA movement or is this a rally to get out the vote? I'm not quite sure what's happening. Yeah, it's a really good question that you're raising, Phil, because part of the reason why Donald Trump is here is partly because this is his hometown, it's his home state. He wants to energize the base. But at this point, there are a lot of people here in this crowd who are already voting for former President Donald Trump. His task and his challenge at this point, Phil, as you know, is to appeal to those undecided voters, those people that are still making up their minds between Donald Trump or Vice President Kamala Harris, or maybe they're on the fence about even voting at all. And if those people hear this speech tonight, it is a major question of whether or not they are going to want to support someone who is spewing things like this or supporting things like this from speakers um, at this rally or when it's not being condemned from the Trump campaign itself just quite yet, Phil. So. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what, what, what the talk is afterwards, what the fallout is from some of the things that were said tonight.